All right, in the second lecture on Much Ado About Nothing, I'm going to talk more specifically about the plot and the issues that the interactions between the characters raise for our analysis. At the beginning of the play, the three noble soldiers, Don Pedro, Benedict, and Claudio, are returning from war. They're returning to Messina. So what does this, what questions does this initially raise for us? How does this situation set our expectations and establish certain topics for us to explore? Well, much like at the beginning of Midsummer Night's Dream, we have a return into society from a chaotic situation before. So we're just getting into this again, a return to normality from some chaos, violent chaos that has happened before the beginning of the play. We also have the question of how to reintegrate these men into society. How do we take the soldier and make him into a citizen? What's the difference between those two types of people? And what are the differences between the relationships that they're involved in? So we initially will see then that we have this tension or this question of the all-male camaraderie, the male-male friendship or homosociality as we talked about it, versus the heterosexual impulse or the heterosexual norm of pairing off men and women. These two different tensions that are going on in the play. And look at the men and think about how do they relate to each other? What do they talk about? What do they joke about? What does this say about what their concerns are, their anxieties, their desires, and so forth? And we can see perhaps a suggested trajectory from war to marriage, from death to life. And we ask ourselves, is that the trajectory that Shakespeare is trying to reinforce? Or is he showing in the ways in which that trajectory is problematic? There are two couples established at the very start of the play. First is the couple of Beatrice and Benedict, or the anti-couple, we might say. Because Beatrice and Benedict do not seem to like each other. At least, that is what they both state over and over and over again. It's what's called a merry war, as Leonato talks about it, as Leonardo calls it. A merry war between Beatrice and Benedict. A war of words, a war of tongues. And we can think about the significance of those images throughout the play and the idea of a merry war between men and women as the soldiers, of course, have just returned from war. And what's at stake between Beatrice and Benedict? Benedict can repeatedly accuses her of being shrewish and cruel and talking too much, and she accuses him of being foolish and vain, egocentric, and deceitful. And it appears that there is some sort of past relationship. Beatrice remembers, recounts that in the past, Benedict and her had had some sort of intimacy, but it had gone sour due to Benedict's unfaithfulness or trickery or just plain not caring. And so these characters, who really are the most popular characters in the play, the center of the play for most viewers, they speak at the beginning of the play, they are against love, they are against marriage. They both talk about how bad marriage is and how bad love is. And they rehearse a lot of very conventional complaints against love and marriage. The other couple that's established at the beginning of the play is Claudio and Hero. These two do not know each other. They are introduced and immediately, Claudio tells Benedict of his great desire and love for Hero. So we have what appears to be love at first sight, if such a thing is possible. Of course, from Midsummer Night's Dream, we know that Shakespeare likes to play with the idea of sight and vision and what it can tell us and its relationship to reason and desire. So what might we think about this idea of love at first sight? And then, thinking about Claudio, Look at the way he talks about his desire to Benedict. What does he ask Benedict about Hero? What does he say about her? How does he describe his feelings? And this can lead us to the question, why does he love her? What does he love about her? What does it mean for Claudio to love Hero? This play revolves around a number of tricks. And the first set of tricks or pranks occurs near the beginning of the play. And they're paired up. 
On the one side, we have Don Pedro, who agrees to court Hero on Claudio's behalf. He tells Claudio and Benedict that he will ask for Hero's hand and give her to Claudio. Why does he do this? What? Why does Claudio need Don Pedro to do this? Why is Claudio himself apparently unable to? And why does Don Pedro agree? What does this tell us about these men and the way they think about sexuality, courtship, marriage, and so forth? On the other side, we have the trick played by the villains. Don John, Don Pedro's bastard half-brother, tells us that he despises all and all happiness, particularly the happiness of Claudio and Don Pedro. He really wants to ruin Claudio and Don Pedro's friendship. So Baraccio says, here's a suggestion, why don't we turn Claudio against Don Pedro? They know about the plan of Don Pedro to court Hero on Claudio's behalf, and they say, let's make Claudio think that Don Pedro is courting her for himself. So we can ask again, why does Don John hate everyone? What does he say as his motivation? What does he explain about himself? And Boraccio's plan, what anxiety is it turning on? That is to say, if this is Boraccio's plan, why does he think it will be successful? What does he expect Claudio to think, either about Don Pedro or about Hero, that will make him to believe, that will make him believe that Boraccio and Don John's trick is plausible, that his friend Don Pedro has betrayed him? We see these tricks unfold in the masquerade scene. The masquerade, it is a formal event, a costume party, where the men disguise themselves and they talk with the women. And under the cover of disguise, we see Don Pedro woo hero. We see Beatrice mock Benedict, and he thinks that she doesn't know that she's talking to him. We see Don John trick Claudio, but then ultimately, Claudio and Hero are engaged. So first off, thematically, what is going on with this masquerade? That we see the key elements of courtship between men and women go on at a formal event in which the men are disguised. What is this saying about the sexual politics, symbolically, thematically, about the way in which men woo women? We also know what do we re what's revealed about, again, the anxieties or paranoias of the male characters in particular. What is it that Beatrice mocks Benedict for, and how does he react to it? Why is he so angered and frustrated by this mockery? And again, why is Don John able to trick Claudio? If Claudio really trusts his friend Don Pedro, then he wouldn't be able to be tricked, correct? So obviously Claudio has some sort of doubt that enables Don John to, at least for a moment, trick him into thinking that his friend has betrayed him. But as we see, again, Don Pedro ultimately says, no, I won her for you, and Claudio and Hero are engaged. But think symbolically about that action. Don Pedro has to approach Hero in disguise, and also Hero's father, and then possesses her, wins her, and gives her to his man, to his uh, friend Claudio. So Shakespeare is showing us something about the way in which women are objectified and traded between men and the way in which male relationships are built on that trade between women, the trade of women between men. After the masquerade, we have the second set of tricks, and they parallel the first tricks as again. In the first set, Don Pedro's trick had been to bring two people together. Don John's trick was intended to tear people apart. Same pattern in the second set. Don Pedro and the others decide that they will play a trick upon Beatrice and Benedict, that they will make these two who hate love and hate marriage so much, they'll flip them and make them fall in love with each other. And how do they do that? by staging scenes in which each thinks that they're overhearing the secret thoughts, the secret desires and pains of the other. 
So Beatrice hears the complaints that Benedict supposedly has made about his suffering. Benedict hears the complaints that Beatrice has made about her suffering for love and so on. And this convinces them to become more uh, humble, to take themselves down and fall for and give their love to the other person. The other trick, Don John and his friends decide, well, if we couldn't turn Claudio against Don Pedro, if that didn't work, let's turn Claudio against Hero. And how do they do that? By casting doubt in his mind, by creating doubt in his mind, that Hero has been unfaithful. They tell him that she has been seen with another man, that she has been seen talking with another man specifically. And then they stage, although this is not performed for us and usually not performed in the play itself, we learn that they are to perform and stage a scene where Baraccio will pretend to be a lover coming to visit Hero and Hero's maid, Margaret, will pretend to be Hero. And they perform this scene, supposedly, and this confirms for Claudio his suspicions, and he believes because he thinks he sees Hero talking to another man, that she has been unfaithful. So what is obviously raised in terms of questions about male anxiety over female bodies, over female sexuality? What does it mean to talk with another person? Why is talking with another man seen as sinful, seen as potentially unfaithful? In the midst of these tricks going on amongst the nobility, the clowns join the plot, finally. Dogberry and the rest of the watch. And they speak in malapropisms, that is, words that are inappropriate, un inappropriate for the context. It's when you use the, usually, the opposite or something close to the opposite of what's intended. So, for example, he says, Our watch, sir, have indeed comprehended to auspicious persons instead of apprehended to suspicious persons. So instead of saying, we've caught two people who look suspicious, they say, we understand two people who look notable and famous. So they say the opposite of what they mean. And again, Dogberry and the Watch are very foolish, and we ask ourselves, what is it that they want? What are their desires? What are they afraid of? How do they do their job? What is it that they get so wrong about their own duties. And why is this funny? This is part of the humorous subplot that they're involved in. On the other hand, we think, we notice that they uncover the plot. It is Dogberry and his friends who, prior to anything being revealed to the nobility, actually find out what's going on, but they are unable to deliver the message. Why? Because Leonardo refuses to listen to them. The wedding scene marks the climax of the primary conflict in the central plot. Claudio and Don Pedro stage it so that they publicly denounced Hero. In front of her friends and family, they claim that she has been unfaithful, untrue, and they humiliate her by impugning her chastity and virginity. And her father, Leonardo, is completely distraught by this, anguished and upset to the point where he himself wishes for Hero to die. He feels that he is dishonored by Hero's crimes. So both the father and the potential husband are marked by the female's body. The female's sexuality is reflects on the virtue of these other men. This shows us something of the covert ways or the unconscious ways in which male identity, masculine patriarchal identity, relies on control of female sexuality. Before Leonardo, however, can get too far in denouncing hero, Friar Francis, who was there to, for the wedding, intervenes. And he comes up with a plan. Let us fake hero's death. Let's tell everyone that she has died. And this will induce remorse. Claudio will feel so guilty about her death that he will feel, that he will apologize for what he's done and take her back. Uh, and even if he doesn't, well then, they'll just go ahead and take Hero into the convent. Everyone will think she's dead and she'll live as a nun, the best she can hope for.
It's a very odd plan, we might think. It, again, might remind us of Midsummer Night's Dream. And notice, though, does it work? Friar Francis says, just by saying that Hero dies, Claudio and Don Pedro will change their tune and become sympathetic towards her and renounce their claims. But is that actually what happens? While the chaos of the failed wedding marks a disruption in the relationship between Claudio and Hero, it marks the next stage in the courtship of Beatrice and Benedict. In the wake of all the chaos, they pronounce their love to each other. And Beatrice tells Benedict that she is loyal to her cousin. She wants to do something to renew her cousin Hero's honor. Benedict, seeing this as his opportunity to prove his love to his new woman, says, what do you want me to do? And Beatrice says two words, kill Claudio. So she asks Benedict to prove his love to her by turning against his male friend, turning against his close, almost brother in arms. And Benedict at first refuses, and Beatrice says, of course you won't, and she wishes that she were a man so that she could carry out this vengeance herself. But finally, Benedict says, all right, I'll do it. I will pledge my loyalty to you. I will challenge them to a, to, to a duel for hero's honor because I believe her to be innocent just as you believe her to be innocent, just as you know her to be innocent. So Benedict changes sides in a sense. He moves from one party to the other and declares himself for his love, Beatrice, not for his male friends and for war. Finally, we come to the happy resolution. And with Shakespeare, happy always needs to be questioned. Whose desires aren't fulfilled? Who needs to be transformed or forcibly reshaped? Who's left out of the resolution? What problems or loose ends remain untied? So Leonardo challenges Don Pedro and Claudio for what he has done to what they have done to his daughter, for killing, as he says, his daughter Hero. We of course know she's not dead, but he says that she has. Don Pedro and Claudio don't care. They mock Leonardo. They say it's unfortunate that she died, but hey, that's what happens. And they say this to Benedict, who then himself challenges Don Pedro and Claudio. And this shakes them both a little bit more, realizing that their close friend has also abandoned them. But then they finally learn Dogberry had captured Don John, who was trying to escape. The deception is revealed. Hero was innocent all along. And Don Pedro and Claudio finally feel their tremendous guilt. And what are they asked to do? They are asked to make amends by publicly renouncing, publicly going back on their attacks on Hero, proclaiming her innocence, and then marrying her cousin, who looks exactly like her, supposedly, or so we're told. So Claudio publicly clears Hero's name at her monument, and her name is monumentalized. She is, her virginity and her innocence are inscribed literally in stone, made into a true fact. And he says, I'll marry her twin cousin, who of course is Hero. So they're reconciled and married at the end of the play. And that seems all right until we wonder, would Hero really want to marry this guy who just was fine with her dying because he thought that she was unfaithful to him and now she's just happy to be married to him? Of course, what choice does she have? How much does Hero really talk in this play? Do we really get a sense of her desires? Is she allowed to speak for herself? Does she have a voice in the same way that Beatrice does? And this also enacts a very strange sort of fantasy in which the potentially unfaithful woman is killed, the unfaithful version of Hero dies off, and then a new Hero is reborn. And that language of death and rebirth is explicitly called upon in the end. So it enacts also a sort of fantasy of 
making the potentially, always potentially unfaithful woman into now a safe woman that the man can feel confident of his quote-unquote ownership of. The love of Beatrice and Benedict is revealed. Of course, they each try to deny it one last time. They want to go back on it, but their love is revealed very particularly, very specifically and notably in their own writing, in the poems and words that they've written down for each other. And they are married. Another quote-unquote happy ending. But how does it end? With Benedict stopping Beatrice's mouth with a kiss. He kisses her mouth and thus silences the most powerful female voice in the play and one of the most powerful and sharpest female voices in all of Shakespeare. So she does get her desire, as does Hero, at least as far as we know their desires. They're married, but both are also silenced in that marriage, in the fulfillment of that desire. So once more, in what way is this resolution really happy? What does happy mean for Shakespeare's audience? So just to review a few prominent themes that we've talked about in this last two lectures. First, masculinity and violence, and the way in which violence is seen as part of the essential identity of masculinity. That's both a topic and a problem in this play. If masculinity is in some way inherently violent, how do you reconcile masculinity into the city, into the state, into the family? How do you temper that violence? We've seen, as in Midsummer Night's Dream, the idea of same-sex bonds in tension with opposite-sex bonds. In particular, we see how male-male friendships are stretched by marriage, just as we also see female friendships being stretched or torn by marriage. The relationship between female sexuality, female quote-unquote virtue, and male identity and the extreme anxiety felt over potential unfaithful women. From the very beginning of this play, there are constant jokes about sexual infidelity, cuckoldry, as it's called. We see them from the start of the play, the jokes that Benedict and Leonardo make at their first meeting, and although they joke and joke about cuckoldry, about female infidelity, as though it were something to be laughed at, it is also the central concern, the central conflict of the play, it's that anxiety over female, ang over female infidelity that almost mars the whole comedy and turns this play into a tragedy. Questions about purity. What does it mean to be pure, especially for a woman? What kinds of pu purity must a woman display in order to be considered a good woman? Fidelity, marriage, and the way in which these impulses, these cultural and social values are tied together. And then, of course, finally, as always in Shakespeare, the question of appearance versus reality. How do we know what we see is what it really is? How do we know what's real? How can we tell from appearance what the truth is underneath the skin? Look at Claudio's speech when he declaims and denounces Hero at the wedding for a key speech, uh, one of the, the great points in Shakespeare where we see this confusion of appearance and reality. So these are some themes, some topics that relate to the plot that we can see revealed through the plot of the play, and hopefully this will help you as you consider your interpretation of Much Ado.